What a wonderful afternoon. What a wonderful day to all of you. Welcome to another uh, monthly webinar from PSQ. Welcome, PSQ Nation. Can you type in um, PSQ right there in your chat box if you're all excited with our learning session for this month? I can see a lot of people who are now logging in from around the world. So can you type in PSQ in the chat box if you are excited to proceed with our topic for today. This is another exciting topic. It's all about quantitative research. Wow, thank you, thank you so much for tuning, tuning in. We have Emmanuel, Inopia, Julian, uh, Rose, Jose, Rian, Dacilia. Oh, thank you so much for tuning in, Mom. Sandy, Mom Sandra May Daraman from DTI, I mean from Landbank, one of our trustees from PSQ. Thank you, thank you so much for tuning in. Can you also type in in there the location where you're logging in? Okay, looks like everyone is all excited for today's session. Let me see some of the comments in here. Can you type in your location? from where you are logging in right now. You can see a lot of good afternoons. That's an overwhelming chat that I can see right now. Uh, Marie Jorvelin Garcia, thank you for tuning in. Emmanuel Inopia from Cebu City, wow. How about the others? From Antipolo, Angeles, Las Piñas City, from Manila. Thank you so much for tuning in. All right, so looks like everyone is now is now all good. I can see I can see also from Makati. Hi, Dr. Ray. I'm in Cavite, Cavite now from Oh Mom Greg. Thank you for tuning in. And by the way, um, we are live in our Facebook page and in our YouTube channel. Uh, you may share your questions while. Um, our speaker delivers his talk. Okay, so I believe we are all excited for today's session. Let me present with you our speaker for today's webinar. <laughs> Our dear speaker is no other than Dr. Jean Paolo Lacap. He is currently the Vice President for Research and Extension of the City College of Angeles in Angeles City, Philippines. He is a recipient of the 2018 Research Productivity Award bestowed by the Philippine Association of Researchers and Statistical Software Users or PAR. Um, par SSU because of his outstanding contributions in research publications in um, Scopus and Clarivate Analytics Index journals. He is also the 2016 Outstanding Business Educator in the field of entrepreneurship and the 2014 Young Achiever Award in Business Education, both awarded by the Philippine Council of Deans and Educators of Business or PCDEB. So with uh, with his outstanding accomplishments in business education, he was con uh, conferred the highest recognition of Diplomat in Business Education or DBE by the Philippine Academy of Professionals in Business Education. He is also a registered marketing professional or RMP and accredited marketing educator and recently awarded the title Registered Business Educator by the Junior Achievement Philippines and Chartered Association of Marketing and Business Professionals. So here we are, our speaker for today, Dr. Jean Paolo Lacap. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Hi, Dr. JP. Good afternoon. Hello, good 
afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am very much happy and privileged to be part of this um, webinar series. So let me share first uh, my presentation. You can share your entire screen, um, Dr. JP. Yeah. Let me... So that when you put it in presentation, whatever be okay. <laughs> okay, let me know if you can see my PowerPoint presentation now. Yes, we can see it, uh, Doc JP. Okay, so um, good afternoon again. So thank you very much, uh, Philippine Society for Quality, for inviting me and deliver a quick talk on emerging trends in quantitative research. So I am Jean Paulo Lacap, the, um, the current Vice President for Research and Extension of our humble institution, the City College of Angeles. Um, for this afternoon session, I will be sharing with you some emerging trends in quantitative research. Uh, most of the things that I will be sharing with you are the trends that I know that are ap applicable when it comes to um, quantitative re research or social science or researches related to um, quantitative social science researches. Okay. And at the same time, um, all the things that I will be sharing with you are basically my experience in terms of quantitative research. And I will be focusing more on um, the use of these emerging trends um, in quantitative research in the context of social science. Okay, so most of the contents of my presentation are my published research papers. And at the same time, I will be dealing with um, um, extensive explanation of the emerging trends, like the use of second generation statistical tests when it comes to quantitative research. Okay. So let me start first my presentation with the different statistical tests. Of course, when we talk about um, quantitative research, okay, one of the things that we need to bear in mind is the use of statistical tests. Um, quantitative research relies heavily on data, uh, particularly numerical data. And at the same time, most of the approaches that we utilize in quantitative research are all about um, statistical approaches. And when we talk about statistical tests, there are two um, generations now of statistical tests. The first one is what we call the first generation statistical tests. And when we talk about um, first generation statistical tests, um, these are the different tests that are commonly used in our quantitative research. Um, and one of the things or one of the um, great things about first generation statistical tests, they are, these are the statistical tests that we are quite familiar with because mostly of these first generation statistical tests are the tests um, that were taught of us during our um, bachelor's degree or maybe in our senior high school. So for example, let's say in first generation statistical tests, we have tests of significant differences. Like for example, let's say if your aim is basically to identify if there's a significant difference between one um, variable um, uh, when we group them, for example, in two groups or maybe two or more groups. So for example, let's say you want to know whether there's a significant difference in the level of, let's say, satisfaction between male and female respondents, then we can come up with a, a research, a quantitative research that utilizes tests of significant difference. So every time we come up with tests of significant difference, we usually employ, let's say, key tests or analysis of variance or, or simply ANOVA if we want to identify tests of difference, be, tests of difference between one, uh, two or more groups. So t-tests uh, and ANOVA are basically parametric tests. And if you're going to review your statistics, when we say parametric tests, these are different statistical tests that follow normal distribution. Or in short, um, when we say parametric, um, the, the distribution of our data is, norm, is normal. On the other hand, we also have what we call tests of significant differences, but this time they are focusing on the non-parametric um, equivalent, uh, which means that we assume that our data is not normally distributed. So if our data is not normally distributed, then we make use of man with Niu, Wilcoxon test, um, cross Calwalis test, John Kier-Terpstra, and median tests. Uh, these are examples of tests of significant difference that fall under non-parametric tests. Then we also have under first generation statistical tests, we have what we call tests of association, such as chi-square. So for example, let's say you want to test something, but this time you want to measure the association between and among variables. 
then we can make use of the chi-square test. So chi-square test is also a first-generation statistical test. Then we also have what we call test of significant relationships. Let's say you want to measure relationship between A and B, or let's say relationships um, between and among A, B, and C variables. So usually we make use of different statistical tests, which may include, for example, Pearson R, which is the most commonly used um, statistical test for tests of significant difference, or say tests of significant relationship rather, and it is a parametric test. And of course, the non-parametric equivalent of Pearson R, we have Spearman's Row, okay? And of course, other types of um, tests of significant relationships, such as, for example, bivariate correlation, canonical correlations, and so on and so forth. Okay, then of course, we also have what we call reg uh, regression analysis and multivariate analysis tests. Um, this include, for example, linear regression, logistic regression, and different multivariate techniques. Okay, and the last one under first generation statistical tests, we have factor analysis, uh, which includes CFA or confirmatory factor analysis and EFA, which is exploratory factor analysis. So typically for factor analysis, um, there are two major um, um, phases or stages that we follow here. One is what we call exploratory factor analysis. If we want to come up with a new construct, for example, and which we want to uh, we want to identify what are the appropriate items that will measure this new construct. So we usually employ what we call EFA, exploratory factor analysis. And of course, if we want to confirm whether this I, uh, these items or these indicators really measure this new construct, we perform what we call confirmatory factor analysis. So all these tests that I have mentioned are basically uh, first-generation statistical tests. But today, we also have what we call second-generation statistical tests. This may include path analysis, which is commonly known as your structural equation modeling. So structural equation modeling is an example of a second-generation statistical test. Why it is called second-generation statistical test? Simply because um, the second-generation statistical test um, fundamentally um, um, addresses okay, um, the limitations of this first-generation statistical test. We know for a fact that um, each of the first-generation statistical tests, they have basic assumptions and they have limitations. And these limitations can now be addressed through the use of what we call second generation statistical tests, such as structural equation modeling. Okay. Um, in structural equation modeling, there are two major divisions now of SEM. One is what we call the traditional SEM, which is the covariance base or the CB SEM, and the, um, the newer one, which is the partial least squares structural equation modeling. Okay. If you will be reading most of the published research papers now in the field of social science, in particular, in the field of business, management, hospitality, tourism, human resource, and so on and so forth, most of the published research papers now are basically under um, structural equation modeling, or most of these papers utilize SEM, structural equation modeling techniques. Um, either CB-SEM, covariance based, and the recent one is what we call partial list squares structural equation modeling okay and in, in my presentation i will be dealing more on sem okay particularly in pls sem because this is the emerging quantitative research technique now okay um if you will be reading literature on structural equation modeling um, most of the recent developments now on structural equation modeling falls under pls sem okay so if you will be reading a lot of literature on PLS-SEM every now and then, there are de developments. And most of the academic researchers now okay, utilize PLS-SEM as their way to come up with quantitative research. Okay, So this will be the focal um, 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 points of my presentation this afternoon. Okay, So just to give you the idea of what's, what's the difference between CBSEM and PLS-SEM, Okay, of course, CBSEM and PLSSEM are both um, structural equation modeling techniques, but they are used differently. Okay, so um, there are different ways on how you can identify whether you will be using CBSEM or PLSSEM in your research. So, for example, let's say if the goal of your study is basically to predict key target constructs 
or identified key driver constructs, then you can use PLS SEM. So what does it mean? If your, your, your quantitative research is all about prediction or the approach is prediction, or basically you want to identify what are your key constructs, then PLS SEM is the more appropriate um, statistical test for you. On the other hand, if your goal, for example, is basically to test a theory or maybe you, you want to have a research that will confirm a particular theory or maybe your goal, you, if you want to compare alternative theories, then CDSM is more appropriate, uh, is more appropriate as a statistical technique uh, for your quantitative research. Okay, and of course, if, for example, if your research is all about exploratory or you want to explore something or you want to come up with an extension of an existing structural theory, okay, um, then um, PLS SEM is more appropriate um, technique for you. So you will see here, these are the different ways on how you can identify whether you will be using PLS SEM, CD SEM, uh, PLS SEM or CD SEM, okay? Um, what is good about um, the second generation statistical test as I mentioned a while ago, every now and then there are recent developments, okay? So for instance, let's say um, in the recent years, um, as I mentioned, PLSM is the more um, newer one compared with CBSM. Um, what is good about PLSM now with the advancement of technology and with the recent developments in structural equation modeling, there are a lot of authors um, that identified a newer technique or a newer approach when we talk about PLSSEM. So, for example, let's say these authors, Bentler and Huang in 2014, Dijkstra in 2014, and Dijkstra Henseler in 2015, they introduced methods that provide consistent PLS SEM estimation. And this PLS estimation or this consistent PLS estimation are basically designed to mimic CBSM. Okay, so what does it mean when we say mimic CBSM? It simply means that the newer technique now in PLS SEM is that um, PLS SEM, particularly the aspect of consistent PLS estimation, can now perform tests similar to CBSM. So it means if, for example, let's say you have a paper that utilizes CBSM today, um, you can also use PLSM as an alternative. Okay, so this is um, the, the, the recent developments now when we talk about um, structural equation modeling, okay? So just to give you a summary of the different ways in order for you to identify whether you will be using PLS SEM, so I provided here a table from here et al. in 2017 um, that provides a, a, a quick overview on what kind of approach or recommended approach um, based on the goal of your study, okay? So you will see here, for example, I'm just going to pick some examples here. Let's say your study is all about prediction, then PLSM is the recommended statistical approach for you. Um, if your objective is exploratory, then PLS, PLSM. If your objective is explanation only, then CBSM, and so on and so forth. And if you will be looking at this table, okay, so this table simply gives us the idea that there are a lot of possibilities when we talk about PLS SEM. So you will see here, most of the different types of analysis mentioned here, we can use PLS SEM, okay? And this is now the recent development when we talk about quantitative research. Um, let's have other examples. Let's say you will see here, if, for example, if your measurement model is formative, then PLSM is appropriate for you. If, for example, your data is not normally distributed, then PLS SEM is, is okay. Um, so this is the beauty of, of uh, um, um, PLS SEM, okay? So there are a lot of possibilities when we talk about PLS SEM, okay? Um, furthermore, here at I'll also mention the possible reasons why PLS SEM is an, an, uh, is an appropriate technique for your quantitative research. So according to here et al, if your framework is all about prediction, as I mentioned, then PLSM is a more appropriate um, statistical approach for you. If your models, uh, if your, your model or your research model is a complex model, 
then PLXM is the solution for that. So typically um, for um, complex models, usually in the first generation statistical test, um, we have hard time measuring complex models. But with PLSSEM, complex model is basically one of the major strengths of this statistical approach. Okay. Um, another thing is if you will be using PLSSEM, um, it supports both reflective and formative constructs. Later, I will be sharing you more with this one because these are two important constructs when we talk about quantitative research. Then what is good about PLSSEM, it can support both small and large sample sizes. Okay, and of course, this is also another um, um, strength of PLSSEM. If your data is not normally distributed, then PLSSEM is okay with that. Okay, so there's no issue for PLSSEM in terms of the distribution, okay, of your data. Okay, so let let me give you a typical example. So this one, the one in your in the slide now, is basically a research paper which was published in 2019 at Asia Pacific Social Science Review. So this is one of the papers that I was able to publish in this prestigious journal. And if you will be reading this research paper, this paper is quite simple in terms of its structure. It only has three major variables and it has only four constructs, uh, uh, four hypotheses rather. So it has three variables and you will see here each of the arrow here represents uh, a particular hypothesis. Okay, so for example, let's say in my hypothesis one, I want to measure whether transformational leadership um, may influence in and intention to quit. Um, which is represented by this arrow, okay, um, the arrow below. Then we have here transformational leadership um, and its influence on employee engagement, okay, the arrow on your left, okay, that connects transformational leadership and employee engagement. And of course, hypothesis three is um, the influence of employee engagement on intention to quit, okay, the one that connects your employee engagement and intention to quit. And the last hypothesis is basically a mediation analysis or the use of what we call med mediator, okay, which is in this simple um, research framework is your employee engagement. So employee engagement here um, was measured in terms of its indirect effect on the relationship between transformational leadership and intention to quit, okay. So you will see here, um, one of the strengths of PLSSEM is it can, it can also measure what we call some intervening effects. Of course, in reality, if you will be measuring, let's say, relationships, let's say A and B, the relationship between A and B, um, not all relationships are linear. There will be possibility that there are factors that may intervene on the relationship or may intervene with, the, with a linear relationship, such as, for example, in this case, um, we assume that employee engagement um, has an intervening effect on the relationship between transformational leadership and intention to quit. Okay, so in this simple illustration, you will see um, mediation analysis can easily be measured using PLS SEM. Okay, so you will see here this, this one is basically a very simple research model. Okay, but for example, if your studies like this, Okay, this is also another paper um, which was published in 2018 with my co-authors, um, Dr. Mulyaningsi and Dr. Ramadani from Indonesia and um, Macedonia. So we, 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 we um, uh, came up with a study on the mediating effects of social entrepreneurial antecedents on the relationship between prior experience and social entrepreneurial intent, the case of Filipino and Indonesian university students. And if you will be reading the content of this research paper, okay, it has, okay, or this is the research framework actually. So it has six variables and you will see these are the different hypotheses that we, we assumed in this paper and we tested, okay? So we have a lot of hypotheses. And um, what we utilize here is still PLS SEM. So what is my point here? Um, what is good about the recent developments now or the emerging trends, particularly in the use of PLSSEM, if your model is too complex, then it, that would not be a problem for PLSSEM because PLSSEM can quickly okay, um, provide you solution with the complexity of your model. Okay, So this is now the emerging trends when we talk about quantitative research. Okay. 
Another thing that I want to share is um, two types of analysis. Um, these are what we call mediation analysis and moderation analysis. Okay. Um, if you will be reading again, um, top tier journals or high rank journals or high impact journals, most of the quantitative research now um, utilize either a mediation analysis or moderation anal analysis or both. Okay. So most of the researchers now employ these techniques because, as I mentioned, okay, mediation and moderation analysis can, can be easily um, understood using PLS-SEM. And at the same time, we can easily process our data if we will be measuring mediation and moderation using PLS-SEM. Um, just to differentiate the two, okay, so when we talk about mediation analysis, this is the use of what we call a mediator. Okay, and when we talk about mediator, it is basically a variable that causes mediation in the dependent and independent variable. Or in other words, it explains the relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variable. So what does it mean? So in this simple illustration, again, you will see we have a mediator here, which is employee engagement. Okay, so employee engagement acts as an intervening variable on the relationship between job satisfaction and effective commitment. Okay, so in this simple illustration, you will see um, employee engagement was used as a mediator or an intervening variable, or we also call it as an indirect variable because it can measure the indirect effect of it on the relationship between job satisfaction and effective commitment. Okay, so the whole process on the use of mediator is what we call a mediation analysis. As I mentioned, the beauty of mediation analysis is ex it explains the reality so, so well. So what does it mean? Because in the first generation statistical test, in most cases, we measure what we call the linear relationship between your dependent and independent variables. But with mediation analysis, we can also measure um, the other factors that may influence okay the relationship between your dependent and independent variables and basically that is the use of what we call a mediator okay so that is mediation analysis one of the techniques that you can um, apply if you will be using pls sem as your statistical approach okay um this is an example of a study the one that i presented a while ago that utilized mediation analysis Okay, so in this paper, I basically measured the mediating effect of employee engagement on the relationship between jobs uh, between um, transformational leadership and intention to quit. Okay, the other one is what we call moderation analysis. Okay, so moderation analysis is quite different from mediation analysis because this time we are using a moderator or what uh, it is also called what we call an interaction variable. Okay. So when we say a moderator, a moderator is basically a qualitative or a quantitative variable that affects the direction and the strength of the relationship between an independent and independent variable. So what does it mean? A moderator is basically an interaction variable that may influence the relative strength okay, of the relationship between um, dependent and independent variable. So for example, let's say in this simple illustration, you will see um, sex here. So let's assume sex is measured using male and female. So um, the, the sex of our respondents, male and female. And we want to know whether sex has something to do or it can affect okay, the, the strength of the relationship between job satisfaction and organizational commitment. Okay, So this type of analysis is what we call moderation analysis. It is the use of a moderator. Okay, So it measures the interaction effect of your moderator on the relationship between your dependent and independent variable okay so there are two ways on how to see moderation analysis okay so there are two ways on how we can measure moderation analysis one is what we call simple moderation and the other one is what we call multi-group analysis so these two techniques are also available for pls sem um, and these techniques are under moderation analysis, but um, they are uh, measured differently. Okay, so to give you an example um, of a simple moderation, so let's have this simple diagram here. 
So let's assume, let's say, um, food safety. We have food safety knowledge here, and we also have um, food safety practice. Okay, and you will see here we have a moderator, which is food as uh, food safety training. Okay, so in this example, you will see we have our dependent and independent variable, which are food safety knowledge and food safety practices. And we have um, a, a moderator here, which is food safety training. And let's assume that food safety training is measured using the number of training. So um, in this illustration, um, food, a number of food safety training is measured on the number of training that the respondent attended. Okay, maybe, for example, in the last 12 months, for example. And here we also measure food safety knowledge and food safety practices as scale variables. Okay, so when I say scale variables, let's say using a Likert scale. Okay, uh, let's say 5 point Likert scale where 5 means strongly agree and 1 means strongly disagree. So you will see in this illustration, um, the number of food safety training here is our moderator. And um, num when we talk about number of food safety training, it means the respondent may respond into following. For example, they may answer this question by saying zero. It means they haven't att attended any uh, food safety training. They can also put, for example, one if they have attended one food safety training or maybe two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. So that type of variable is what we call a continuous variable. So if your moderator is a continuous variable, such as in this case, food safety training, then we will be using simple moderation. Okay, so food safety training here is a moderator that may affect the strength of relationship between food safety knowledge and food safety training. Okay, so remember, in simple moderation, the requirement is your moderator should be a continuous variable. On the other hand, if, for example, your, your, your uh, moderator is a categorical variable, such as, for example, sex, okay, like um, um, the respondents will respond whether they are male or female, then you will see here our moderator here, sex, is basically uh, a categorical variable. And, of course, sync, um, we, we assume that we have same dependent and independent variable. We have food safety knowledge and food safety training, which were both measured using scale, such as Likert scale. So if your moderator, okay, is a categorical variable, then the appropriate moderation analysis technique for you is basically MGA or multi-group analysis. So you will see here, simple moderation and multi-group analysis are examples of ways on how we can measure the moderating effects of our moderator. Okay, so in general, we call this approach or this type of analysis as moderation analysis. Okay, so just to give you an example of a study that we did um, actually this year. So this is a study um, on food safety knowledge, attitude, and practice, uh, practices and training of fast food restaurant food handlers, a moderation analysis. So this paper was published in British Food Journal, one of the leading journals in food and food related studies okay so we were able to publish this one this year last march 2021 and if you will be reading this paper okay um it utilized um simple moderation so you will see here there are three major variables here food safety knowledge food safety practices and attitude towards food safety okay and in this case um, we measured the moderating effect of food safety training, which, which was measured using the number of food safety training attended by the respondents. Okay, so here we, we measured whether food safety training may affect the relationships, okay, um, of each of the arrows represented in this um, um, research framework. Okay, so this study utilized simple moderation. Okay. I also um, did a research uh, in 2019 um, using multi-group analysis where my, where my moderator is a categorical variable. So the study that I did uh, in 2019 is, uh, was entitled Interrelationships of Social Media Use, Brand Equity, and Their Visit Intention, the case of Angeles City and City of San Fernando. Um, this paper uh, or this research was funded by the Department of Tourism. So in 2019, I was able to receive a research grant from the Department of Tourism. So they funded this whole paper. 
Um, and in this paper, basically, I utilize PLS SEM. Um, and further, with my analysis, what I did is basically I use multi group analysis. Okay. So here, basically, I simply came up with a study uh, measuring if there are significant differences in the responses of those tourists that went to Angela City versus those tourists who went to City of San Fernando. Okay. So that is basically the study. And if you will be reading this paper, this is the research framework that I proposed for this um, study. And as I mentioned, I, I use a multi-group analysis or MGA um, just to differentiate um, the, the interrelationships of the variables under study um, between the tourists from Angeles City and City of San Fernando. Okay. So this is an example of a study that utilized PLS-SEM as a statistical approach and multi-group analysis, okay, as the type of analysis used for this research paper, okay? Um, another thing that is quite important with the recent developments now in quantitative research is basically the treatments of our constructs, okay? So how do we treat our constructs? Typically, we have what we call the first-order construct, okay? So first order construct is also called LOC or the lower order construct. This is a type of construct that is considered a unidimensional. Okay? Whereas when we say second order construct or also called higher order construct, we, um, we, um, this, these are constructs that are multidimensional in nature. Okay? So what does it mean? Let, let me give you an example. So let's look at this simple um, research framework. Um, this research framework is a framework of my MBA students, okay? So um, last year, he did his MBA thesis, and this was the framework that he utilized in his MBA thesis. Uh, basically, in his academic thesis, um, he wants to measure um, the impact of public service motivation and organizational citizenship behavior on organizational performance of a government agency in Central Zone, Okay. So this paper um, talks about public service motivation, organizational citizenship behavior, and organizational performance. So these are the three major constructs or variables of the study. And if you're going to look at this um, simple illustration or this simple model, okay, under public service motivation, there are four dimensions. It means public service motivation is measured using four dimensions according to the literature. And these um, four dimensions include attraction to policy making, um, commitment to public interest, compassion, and self sacrifice. Okay, on the other hand, you will see in the one in the middle organizational citizenship behavior, um, OCB or organizational citizenship behavior was measured unidimensionally. It means it has no dimensions. So um, you will see here um, organizational. Um, citizenship behavior, since it is unidimensional, then it is considered what we call a first order or a lower order construct, okay? Moreover, um, performance, um, organizational performance was also measured here, but organizational performance was measured in three dimensions. Um, this include efficiency, effectiveness, and fairness, okay? So you will see here these three variables or these three dimensions rather falls under organizational performance. And they were measured as a multidimensional construct, okay? So in this example, you will see public service motivation and organizational performance, since they have dimensions, okay? These two variables, PSM and OP, are considered second order construct or higher order construct. On the other hand, um, organizational commitment or organizational citizenship behavior, rather, is a, a variable that is considered LOC or first order construct. Why is that so? Because it has no dimension. It is unidimensional. Now, why do I need to emphasize this one? Okay, in doing a quantitative research, it is a must for us to identify how we will be treating our constructs. Are we going to treat them as first order construct? Or are we going to treat them as a second order construct? What is the importance of this? Um, in quantitative research, particularly in the use of PLS SEM, um, um, the identification or the classification of constructs are measured differently. 
Okay? So if you will be measuring first order construct, the measurement model is different. If you will be measuring second order construct, the measurement is also different. So from the onset, as a researcher, we need to identify properly whether our construct will be measured as first order or as a second order construct. Now, how will you know if you will be using first order or second order construct? Then you need to read now the literature. This is the beauty of what we call literature review. You need to re um, um, read and analyze past literature or past studies in order for you to properly distinguish uh, distinguish whether a construct will be used as a first order construct or as a second order construct. Okay? So this is an example of the utilization or classification of construct, whether they are first order or second order construct. Okay? I also have another example, but this time I will be tweaking um, the previous um, 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 research framework. This time, I will be using this simple framework. Okay, so this framework is almost the same as the one that I discussed a while ago. But you will see here, um, public service motivation is still uh, a multidimensional because it has still four uh, four dimensions here. But you will see um, 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 organizational performance now um, having three dimensions, eff efficiency, effectiveness, and fairness. Okay, these variables now or these dimensions were treated as first order or unidimensional construct. Okay, so you will see here in our previous illustration, we only have one variable pointing from PSM going to organizational performance. But this time in the second model, um, there are three arrows that points to efficiency, effectiveness, fairness from public service motivation. So in this case, you will see efficiency, effectiveness, and fairness are treated now as lower order construct together with OCB, organizational citizenship behavior. And public service motivation is still a higher order or a first order construct. Okay, so you will see here same concepts, almost the same concepts, but since they were treated differently, okay, so you will see <clears throat> the classification of all uh, constructs also change. Okay, so as I mentioned, if you will be doing a research, it is a must for you to from the onset that you already know whether your construct will be measured as first order or a second order construct. Okay, um, these are just examples of study that I did using first order construct or lower order construct. So this paper. Um, was written by my by me, of course, and of course my co-author, Dr. Tung Kab, and this was also published at Asia Pacific Social Science Review. So it has something to do with brand management, the influence of brand experience and brand loyalty among mobile phone users in Pampanga, Philippines, a mediation analysis. And if you will be reading this paper, all the variables or the constructs that we use here are all first order constructs. They are unidimensional. Okay. Um, I also have another paper uh, wherein I use second order construct. Okay, so in this paper, the title of the paper um, is Effects of Experiential Quality on Experiential Loyalty Evidence from Starbucks Coffee Chains in Pampanga, Philippines, uh, which is um, um, co written by my good friend, um, Dr. Sikat of University of the Assumption here in Pampanga. So we did a study. Actually, this um, this paper was already accepted for publication for June 2022 issue of Asia Pacific Social Science Review. Okay, and if you will be reading the entire paper, we utilize here second order construct or higher order construct for the variable experiential quality. Okay, so if you will be looking or analyzing this um, framework of the study, experiential quality was measured using one, two, three, four dimensions. So these four dimensions include interaction quality, physical environment quality, outcome quality, and affective quality. So experiential quality in this um, um, study is, uh, is an example of a multidimensional. So experiential quality is considered a second order or a higher order construct. Okay. Um, another thing that I want to emphasize also with the recent developments of quantitative research is um, how you're going to uh, measure your construct. Are you going to measure your construct um, reflectively or are you going to measure your construct formatively? 
Okay? So what is the difference between reflective and formative construct? Okay? Just to give you an example, okay? Um, for example, let's say we have a variable here, satisfaction, okay? So you will see here I have two examples just to differentiate um, um, uh, to all of you the difference between reflective and formative construct. So um, the first example here is satisfaction where in satisfaction as a construct was util uh, utilized reflective items. So it means satisfaction in this example is a reflective construct. Now, what is a reflective construct? A reflective construct is characterized by highly correlated items. Okay, so what do I mean when I say highly correlated items? In this example, I have variable satisfaction, which is a reflective construct. And let's assume it has three indicators or three items. Okay, so let's try to analyze. How will you know if it is a reflective construct? And uh, let's try to read the first item. So the first item is, I feel well in this hotel. Okay, so the first item talks about um, the feeling that you have experienced from the hotel. Okay, so let's assume satisfaction is here is a measure of satisfaction in a hotel. The second is I'm always happy to stay in this hotel. So the happiness that you gain from staying in the hotel. And the, the third one is I recommend this hotel to others. Okay, so let's assume we will be answering this one. We are the respondents. And we will be answering this one using a five-point Likert scale where five means strongly agree and one means strongly disagree. So let's assume, um, let's provide our response. So let's say in the first item, I feel well in this hotel. And let's assume that you really experience um, really well in staying in that hotel. So what would be your possible answer or response for item number one? So most probably your response would be five. Strongly agree that you felt so well in that hotel. Okay. How about number two? I'm always happy to stay in this hotel. Of course, if you felt well in that hotel, most probably you are also happy staying in that hotel. Okay, so your response could be maybe also five, strongly agree. And of course, if you felt well and you were happy, most probably you're going to recommend that hotel to others. So what would be your possible response in item number five? Okay, uh, most probably you're going to answer also five, strongly agree. So you will see here, in the three items that measure satisfaction, all the answers are moving in one direction. They are in the positive direction or favorable direction because the answer are all or are all five strongly agree. That is an example of what we call highly correlated items. So a reflective construct is characterized by a highly correlated items. Okay. So if your items are highly correlated, then your construct is a reflective construct. Okay. On the other hand, let's assume the other example on the right side, okay? So let's assume here we also have same variable or construct. We have satisfaction and we have three items also that measure satisfaction. So here you will see the first item talks about what? The service is good. So it talks about service. The second one is the personnel are friendly. So it talks about personnel. And the third one is the room is well equipped. It has something to do with the equipment of the room. Okay. And let's assume we, we are the respondents and we will be using also a five-point Likert scale. Okay. So let's assume in the first item, the service is good. And let's say you really experience a good service from the hotel. So what would be your possible answer to this one or response to this one? Maybe your answer will, will be five. You strongly agree that the service is good. How about number two? The personnel are friendly. Okay. Let's assume in your experience you did not ex uh, you experienced rude personnel. Okay. So even though the service is good, but there is one personnel that is completely rude. So what would be your possible response in item number two? So most probably your answer would be two, um, disagree or maybe one, strongly disagree. Okay. And how about number three? The room is well equipped. And based on your experience, the room is not really well equipped. So what would be your possible response here? Most probably your response is two, um, 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 disagree. So you will see here, your answer in number one, uh, the first item is five. But in item two, your answer is one. And let's say your answer in item three is two. So you will see here, the answer of the respondents are not moving in the same direction. It means 
the items or the indicators are not highly correlated. Okay? So if the items are not highly correlated, then the construct is an example of a formative construct. Okay? So what is the importance? Why do we need to classify them? Because in quantitative research, the way we measure validity and reliability of our construct for reflective is different from the way we measure validity and reliability for formative construct. In short, if your construct is a reflective construct and you want to measure the validity and reliability of it, okay, there are three ways on how you can test for validity and reliability of a reflective construct. These are internal consistency using Cronbach's alpha and composite reliability. Um, number two, convergent validity um, using factor loading and average variance extracted. And number three, discriminant validity using foreigner larger criterion and HTMT ratio of correlation. Okay, or simply HTMT. Okay, heterotrate, monotrate ratio. Okay, so you will see here for reflective construct, there are three things that you need to establish. Internal consistency, convergent validity, and discriminant validity. Okay, so these are the three requirements in the measurement of validity and reliability. On the other hand, if your construct is a formative construct, then every time we test for validity and reliability, there are also three requirements. These are convergent validity, but this time you will be using redundancy analysis. Number two, collinearity. And number three, outer weight and significance. So what have you noticed in this um, slide? A reflective um, construct is different from formative construct, also in terms of uh, validity and reliability. The requirement for reflective construct are different. The requirement for formative construct are different. That's the reason if you will be doing a quantitative research, it is a must for you from the onset that you already know whether your construct is a reflective construct or a formative construct because the way we measure the model is different. Okay? So that is the importance of knowing whether our construct is a reflective construct or a formative construct. Okay? So just to give you an example, so this paper, which I co-wrote with my um, good colleagues in Malaysia, Dr. Cham and Dr. Lim, okay? So we did a paper which was published at the International Journal of Economics and Management by University Putra, Malaysia. So it has something to do with corporate social responsibility and its influence on brand loyalty and the mediating effects of brand satisfaction and perceived quality. So if you will be reading this paper, okay, all the constructs that we use here um, utilize reflective construct, okay? And you will see here, if you will be um, reading the entire paper, um, validity and reliability were measured. This one is for internal consistency or reliability test, composite reliability and Cronbach's alpha. Then we also have indicator loading and average variance extracted, which is measurement for convergent validity. And we also measure discriminant validity using foreigner larger and we also use um, discriminant validity using HTMP ratio. Okay? So you will see here the measurement of validity and reliability is quite different. Okay? For reflective construct. Okay? There's also another study wherein we utilize formative construct this time. Okay? So for a formative construct, okay, um, in this study, all the variables that we use here are formative construct. And if you will be reading the entire paper, one of the glaring characteristics of a formative construct is the presence of what we call a global item. Okay? So what is a global item? A global item is the last item in the measurement of your formative construct that measures the overall perception of the respondent towards the formative construct. So you will see here the last item, which is the 18th item. You will be, um, you will be seeing here the item um, is written or it is expressed as overall, I have a good knowledge about food safety. Since this construct is all about food safety, you will see the global item is overall, I have a good knowledge about food safety. Okay? So that is one of the glaring characteristics of a formative construct, the presence of what we call a global item. So what is the purpose of a global item? Okay, a global item is used for us to measure convergent validity using redundancy analysis. 
So you will see here, this is the actual result of this paper. And this is the actual result of the redundancy analysis, which is a requirement for the measurement model of a formative construct. Okay. And if you will further read this paper, um, we also measured collinearity here, which is one of the requirements for formative and also the outer weight and the corresponding significance. Okay. So you will see here, if you will be comparing the first paper that I presented, wherein the variables or the constructs are reflective, and with this paper, wherein the constructs are formative, the level of measurement are quite different. So it is very important for us that from the onset, we already know whether our construct is formative or reflective. Okay? And I think this will be my last slide um, because I only have one hour. Um, on the um, estimating our sample size, um, you can estimate, uh, of course, you are familiar with Slovin's formula. And if you are still using Slovin's formula, I would suggest that you read this paper by Tejada and Puzalan. The title is on the misuse of Slovin's formula. Okay, in this paper, they explain the reason why Slovin's formula um, is used um, or it is misused, mostly misused by researchers. Okay, so personally, I do not use the Slovin's formula as to estimate my sample size because there are now also emerging techniques on how we can estimate our sample size. So for example, let's say the use of G-Power. If you are familiar with G-Power, G-Power is an application wherein it utilizes um, statistical power to measure um, the possible level or the possible sample size for your quantitative research. And it relies heavily on statistical power and the statistical test that you will be using for your um, study. So for example, if your study will utilize correlation, then you simply set the, the um, software into correlation, then type your effect size, alpha level, and your power level, then it will compute for you the total sample size. Okay, so this is the use of G power. This is one of the application that is widely used now by um, researchers or quantitative researchers. And of course, the most recent in terms of the development of calculating the sample size is um, the, these two methods, um, which are called inverse square root and gamma exponential method. Okay, so the inverse square root and gamma exponential method are the two methods developed by Medcock and Pierre Hadaya. Um, actually, this is the most recent. This, their paper was only published in 2018. And this is now the widely used um, sample size estimation okay, for um, advanced researchers. Personally, most of my published research papers, I utilize inverse square root and gamma exponential method. Okay? So all the things that I've mentioned okay, from moderation, mediation, reflective, formative, um, higher and lower order construct up to estimating sample size. All these things can be done using PLS SEM. Okay? And this is now the trend, or these are now the emerging trends when we talk about quantitative research. Okay? So, as I mentioned, the beauty of PLS SEM is that most of the limitations of our first generation statistical test can now be addressed by second generation statistical tests. And personally, one of the things that I love about PLS SEM is the um, they can measure complex models. It means if I have a lot of variables or constructs to measure, then PLS SEM um, will have uh, will have no issue at all with the complexity of my model. Okay, and these are now the emerging trends when you talk about quantitative research. Okay, so this is an example of uh, an actual study. So in this study, we use inverse square root method and gamma exponential method. Um, by the way, gamma exponential method and inverse square root method can be, um, or you can utilize these two methods using the software called WarPLS. Okay, so you can download it. Uh, actually, it is not free. It is a commercial software, um, but it has three-month trial version. So maybe you can download it and try first if you are okay with it. Okay, so this is the software, the only software that is available in measuring gamma exponential and inverse square root methods. Okay. Um, this is also another paper where I utilize um, gamma exponential inverse square root. This is the typical results of the software. Okay, the one in figure two here. Okay. So before I end this presentation, I want to share this simple quote from Al Alvin Tuffler. 
by instructing students how to learn and, and learn and relearn a powerful a powerful new dimension can be added to education okay um, I think um, this, these three skills are very much needed for, for our students and also for us um, who are going to do research or other endeavors. We need to know how to learn and learn and always relearn. Okay? So thank you very much. I hope I was able to share with you even a little of my knowledge when we talk about emerging um, developments in the field of quantitative research, particularly in PLS SEM. Again, thank you very much and good afternoon. Wow, that's very insightful. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Doc JP. So for our viewers, our participants for today, you can type in your questions right there in the chat box. Your questions or your insights regarding the presentations. I can see in here some of the comments Doc JP, they mentioned very comprehensive presentation, great presentation. I can also see in here, so they're thanking you. Thank you so much, Dr. JP from uh, Chris Marie, uh, from Rochelle. Yes, Dr. Lakoff, I learned so much today. That's amazing. So while we are still awaiting for maybe a couple of questions from the participants of Doc JP, um, do we need, I mean, there's a lot of researchers, right? And then they, they know the end-to-end the -end process and how they do research. However, when it comes to doing or running a statistical um, test, that's where they struggle um, most of the time. Um, do you need to be a statistician for you to run all of those analysis that you, that you enumerated, Doc JP? Actually, um, I myself, I am not basically a graduate of statistics. I do not have knowledge in statistics in the first place, but because of my passion in research, I basically invested a lot in terms of um, statistics because um, I want to be at par when it comes to research, um, particularly in quantitative research, because when I finished my doctorate degree, um, I just felt that um, I lacked the skill in research um, even though I already have my doctorate degree. And um, there was also, I think there, there was a, a point um, in my career as a professor then where I read one paper that utilized structural equation modeling and I really do not understand the content of the paper. And I said to myself, why I do not understand this paper? I am a doctorate student. I, I, I finished my doctorate degree in business. How come I do not understand um, PLS SEM? That was that was the turning point wherein I read a lot first about PLS SEM. Then I connected with um, an organization that provides training on PLS SEM. Then from there, what I did is basically try to um, absorb everything about PLS SEM. And after the training, what I did immediately was to come up with a research using PLS SEM. Um, my point here is um, with the advent of technology, because PLS SEM now is done um, using a software, so it is much easier for us to learn PLS SEM. Okay, um, even my students now in the graduate school, because I am teaching in the graduate school, and what I teach or what I, I, I what I use in my advanced statistics uh, uh, class classes are basically I do not teach anymore the manual computations. Instead, I go directly with the use of software. Why is that so? Because I want my students to learn um, that um, it is not really hard, okay, to come up with research, particularly a quantitative research that utilizes sophisticated statistical tests, okay? Because in reality, with the aid of technology now, with the the aid of this this different software available, you can actually easily um, compute everything, okay? Um, if you have for example, just try to watch a, a, a quick video on PLS SEM um, on YouTube because there are a lot of videos available now. If you will be watching even a one video, you will be fascinated how powerful the software is. Because, for example, um, currently I am using War PLS as my software, but of course there are a lot of software available. Um, I find um, um, War PLS as the most user friendly. This is only a personal opinion, of course. Um, um, and in War PLS, there are only five steps that you need to follow in order for you to perform PLS SEM. And once you master all those five steps, it is much easier for you to conduct a study that utilizes PLS SEM. Okay? 
Um, as I mentioned, if you will be reading a lot of papers now, particularly published research papers from high-ranked journals, most of these papers are, are basically papers that utilize PLF that we have. And you don't really need a statistician as long as you are eager to learn and you have the passion to learn PLSSEM, it is much easier for you to use, use PLSSEM with your research endeavors. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Doc JP. It's really more about your curiosity and your passion on, on re research. I would agree with you, Doc JP. Uh, there's a question in here from Richelle. Uh, Dr. Laka, I attended some panel defense and panel, and the panel discouraged the use of five-point Likert scale to avoid biases. Is it true? Actually, it depends. Again, my answer on that is dep it depends on the goal of the study. So, for example, if your study is more descriptive, for example, you simply want to describe your the responses of your respondents. Uh, for example, let's say you are going to conduct a study. This is just an example, satisfaction or job satisfaction of employees. And your study is completely descriptive, then it is um, okay for you to remove the middle answer, okay? In order for you to come up with um, um, an, uh, a descriptive statistics that are leaning towards either positive or negative, okay? But if your study, for example, is inferential, like, for example, you're going to make use of hypothesis testing and your study has less emphasis on descriptives, rather it is inferential, then a 5-point Likert scale or even a 7-point Likert scale will be okay. Because in hypothesis testing, you are basically testing your hypothesis uh, based, uh, of course, using the different statistical tools available. Then in that case, um, the middle answer will, will be less of a factor. Okay, so it always depends on what's your goal of your study. If, for example, your goal is purely descriptive, then it is okay to remove the middle answer in order for you to have the idea whether the respondents are, mo are um, then the responses of the respondents are moving towards positive or moving towards negative. Okay? So that is my answer to that, to the question. Thank you for that, Doc JP. There's another question in here from uh, Philip, uh, Philip Joseph. Why in choosing your drivers did not use PCA? I believe it's much powerful to fuse it with PLS in food um, safety PCA. training. Yeah. Yeah. In, other words, in food safety yeah, training, for example, we can eliminate the assumption the contribution of using trainings provided by different entities, for example. Okay. Let me um, answer first the use of PCA. Um, PCA is also part of um, 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 what they call this factor analysis technique. Um, um, PCA can also be utilized, but of course, there are a lot of assumptions about PCA com compared with other types of factor analysis tests. Um, it depends also with the type of analysis because, as I mentioned, factor analysis still falls down, falls under first generation statistical tests. Okay, but with um, what is good with PLS SEM, for example, let me just give you an example. In PLS SEM, if you want to do confirmatory factor analysis, you can go with PLS SEM because PLS is, PLS SEM is basically CF, uh, CFA, confirmatory factor analysis. Why is that so? Because in PLS SEM, if you will be reading the literature about it, there are two stages in PLS SEM. One is the evaluation of your measurement model, and number two is the evaluation of your structural model. In the measurement of your um, uh, in the evaluation of your measurement model, you are basically measuring the validity and reliability of your construct. That is basically confirmatory factor analysis. Then, of course, the second stage is basically um, um, structural modeling or the evaluation of your structural model, wherein you are going to measure the hypothesized relationships. So here you are measuring the beta coefficient, you are measuring the effect sizes, and so on and so forth. Um, if you will be using, for example, a, a first-generation statistical test, you will be doing it one by one. But with PLS-SEM, if you will be using PLS-SEM as your statistical approach, the software will calculate everything for you. All you need to do is basically identify which of these results are necessary and which of these results are very important in your research. Okay? So that is the beauty of second-generation statistical tests. Okay? Um, it, they addresses the limitations of our first-generation statistical tests. 
All right, thank you, thank you so much for that, um, Doc JP. As much as we would want to answer all of the questions, but we can only um, maybe entertain just one last question, Doc JP. Uh, the last question is coming from Leia. Hi, Doctor Lakap. What software can you recommend for statistical methods in research? Okay, if you will be using first generation statistical tests. Um, of course, the typical IBM FPSS, but if you um, if you do not want a commercial one, you can use Jamovi. Jamovi is almost similar with IBM FPSS. The main difference is Jamovi is free. You simply go to jamovi.org and download the software. That is for free, so you can perform first-generation statistical tests up to basic PLS SEM also in Jamovi. But if, for example, you want to make use of second-generation statistical tests like the PLS SEM, um, you can have or you can use WARP PLS. Um, and it's the major competitor of WARP PLS is Smart PLS. You can also use that. So those two softwares are now the commonly used softwares in in in, WAR, uh, in PLS SEM. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for that, Doc JP. I'm also using the Jam. A movie <laughs> because it's free <laughs> all right so let me present to, to you doc jp the certificate let me present this now the certificate of appreciation let me read the citation right here doc jp the certificate is awarded to dr jean paolo g lakap for imparting valuable insights and inspiration to the participants during the webinar emerging trends in quantitative research in august 2020-21 signed by yours um truly so thank you thank you so much um doc jp by the way for all of our participants for today we will be issuing you certificates but you have to answer our evaluation survey in here we can also send some of your feedback to doctor uh to doc jp so you can scan the qr code that we are flashing right now on the screen all right and then you can also access the post evaluation survey right here in the email that we sent out to to you before the start of our webinar session so by the way thank you so much again doc jp thank you so much for being with us we will be sending you the certificate um, in a couple of, of days most probably maybe later or or maybe over the the weekend thank you thank you so much let me proceed right now to presenting with you um psq the Philippine Society for Equality, um, who we are, we it's established in 1969. Our current vision is PSQ will be the leading network that inspires and shapes quality and organizational excellence leaders. And our mission is we are a network of agile, innovative, and trusted partner of choice who create value and drive advancement in quality and organizational excellence. Over the course of, you know, X number of decades, more than five decades, you are able to bring you the international popular quality gurus from around the globe. We also partnered with various organizations, local and international organizations. And we also have in here the, the national awards from PSQ. We have individual awards, the Duran Medal Quality Manager of the Year Award. We also have organizational awards like uh, the Philippine Benchmarking Award, Philippine Best Practice Award, PSQ Team Innovation, and PSQ Team Excellence Awards. We are also the partner of the DTI Competitiveness Bureau from the Administration of the Philippine Quality Award for the private sector. I also want to invite you to the 32nd National Quality Forum with the theme Emerging Stronger Than Ever Shaping the Future of Quality. So that's on October 15th. So please be there and in, in the history of um psq of holding national quality forum this is so far the cheapest in terms of the um, investment fee for the participants so please take advantage of this rare opportunity this national quality forum and we still are open for the sponsorship opportunities and you can get in touch with our secretariat and this is related to our topic for today we are open this is a call for a call for paper 
or four papers for our first PSQ research conference on quality. That's what we call RESCON with the theme keeping ahead of the curve towards a resilient future. That's on October. Uh, that's on December 2 to 3, 2021. So please get in touch with our secretariat and please send your papers. And we are also calling for articles for the official publication of the Philippine Society for Quality. That's the PSQ Nation. So you just have to get in touch with our secretariat. And we are extending our the submission of your articles up to the second week of October. So be a PSQ member, so please join us. Just get in touch with secretariat at psq.org.ph or you can go to our Facebook page and you can message us from, from there. And we are we we are in the social media space from Facebook, LinkedIn, um, YouTube, Instagram, and you can also message us via the secretariat at psq.org.ph. So that's it for this month webinar. Thank you so much for being with us and you stay safe.